Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Four Steps to Com CMS Compliance and Implementation and API Security Primer. API security, patient consent management, and data privacy are fast becoming major design considerations for public health care APIs. While public APIs provide accessibility and a valuable platform for innovation, they also significantly increase the risk of data breaches. During this WSO2 and Ping Identity Joint webinar, you'll learn about technology requirements and four steps and the steps necessary for healthcare organizations to deploy APIs that enable technology systems and software applications to securely communicate, exchange data, and use shared information. Having been consistently recognized as industry leaders by Forestry Research Inc's The Forester Wave and Gartner Magic Quadrant, in partnership, WSO2 and Ping uniquely provide you with a solution that offers full lifecycle API management, including pre-built FHIR APIs, alongside powerful AI-driven API security protection and centralized monitoring. So today, as we get started, <clears throat> we'd like to better understand your needs relative to today's webinar topic. So I'd like to ask you to respond, if you would, to a brief poll. I'm gonna provide those that poll now, and I'll just give it a few, few seconds for everybody to look it over and reply. Uh, okay, thank you for replying to our poll. Um, now, uh, let me introduce our presenters for today's webinar. My name is Michael Ruse. I'm the Product Marketing Director for WSO2 Open Healthcare. And our product experts presenting today are Mifan Karim, who is Vice President of Solutions Architecture here at WSO2, and Bernard Herginvigi, who is Chief Technology Officer at Ping Identity. Um, next slide, please. Uh, during today's webinar, Mifan and Bernard will cover an overview of 21st Century Cures Act security needs and requirements, how to implement and secure fire APIs along the four categories of design, connect, secure, and monitor. We'll introduce you to the WSO2 Ping Fire Sandbox. And finally, we'll have time for questions you may have. So please feel free to post yours in the Q&A section as they come up. And then just as a note, following the webinar, we'll send the uh, recording and the slides to you. Uh, you'll also receive an implementation and API security primer and quick reference guide, as well as access to and a guide for using our joint WSO2 ping sandbox. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn that over to our turn it over to our experts, Mifan and Bernard. So, guys, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thanks for all of you uh, to all of you for joining us. So, we're going to talk about the Cures Act, and I have a few slides to talk about what it is, uh, not too many, uh, and then we'll dive straight into implementation security aspect. And we want to give some good time to Mifan at the end. Uh, to talk about the sandbox and what you can do with it. So let's talk about the Cures Act. What is it? Um, well, it's really a, a government-driven uh, adoption of standards for accessing and sharing health information. Uh, the facilitation of sharing of health information has become critical. Obviously, um, anyone should be able to uh, go to an application and, and get the latest test results, uh, get to know what um, came out, out of the hospital visit and so forth. So it's allowing people to really access and share. And this is all done via APIs. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. How do you implement those? How do you secure those? How do you monitor those, right? So let's, uh, let's move on. Um, it's all about APIs. And those have certain implementation deadlines set by the government. The first two boxes on the left are from the Center for Medicare and Medicare um, Services. 
Uh, and as you can tell, even so, those uh, enforcement were required of January of this year. Uh, the enforcement, meaning penalties, will start getting applied in July of this year. Um, patient access API is really what started the whole thing, is really what it is, right? How do we use an API to access my information with a third party health you know, um, applications? And the second one is really about uh, insurance providers uh, delivering via the web uh, access to director information for the hospitals and clinics that are participating with their plans. And then information blocking uh, is all about uh, same thing, information to my health information. But now this is driven by the Office for National Coordinator for Health IT. The deadline for that implementation is April 5th of this year, which was just about right, a week or so ago. There are more than that, uh, but the enforcement and applications uh, uh, have different dates and uh, we will send you a document uh, uh, with, uh, with an email that gives you more information on the rest. So let's talk about how do you go about uh, addressing those requirements. So first and foremost, right, APIs. So uh, the FIRE API is the Health Level 7 API, uh, which is required to implement most uh, of the Cures Act uh, data sharing and access uh, accessibility. Uh, you literally have to put that API in front of the data sources. You have to document it. You have to make that documentation, meaning the syntax, the data structure, the hide works, all of that has to be made public. And obviously it's a gold mine for um, bad actors, people who are trying to steal health information and, and security of those API <clears throat> is gonna become critical for, for everyone. Now, don't forget that <clears throat> those API give you access to protected health information, um, HIPAA type information. And so the penalties for having an illegal are pretty serious. So security, critical, good implementation, critical, good monitoring, critical. That's what this whole presentation is about. And then uh, obviously underneath this, you need a, a pretty strong identity infrastructure for properly accessing in, secure, in total security those APIs. And you need to provide consent, right? So that uh, all access to someone's health information has been consented by the patient. And we'll talk about that too. All right, moving on. In reality, what, what does that really mean? It means that as a, as a patient, right, I'll be able to use either uh, a, a, a insurance provided application, the payer or a third party app, uh, can be any healthcare app uh, to access my insurance information, what happened, what, what I get reimbursed for, what can be reimbursed and so forth via a fire API. Uh, or uh, I can, when I go to the hospital, uh, I can make sure that my primary care uh, uh, information uh, is provided to the hospital uh, so that uh, they have the information that I wanted to share with them, remember consent, uh, to take care of me or my kids. And vice versa, if the hospital uh, gets you in an emergency room, they have the obligation to notify your primary care provider as well, again, through this fire API. So this is really gonna uh, have, I think, uh, a major impact in how we manage our health, manage our health expenses, how we look for health providers, the right clinics, the right doctors, uh, the right cost information. This is all about that. Okay, uh, let's move on. At this point, Mifan, I'm gonna let you take over. You're muted, Mifan. Sorry, <laughs> thanks for pointing that out. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thanks Bernard for giving that great overview and, and thanks Michael for the overview as well. So I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, as Bernard mentioned, we can look at categorizing this into 
designing APIs, designing your interfaces, connecting different backend systems, securing everything together, and then ob obviously observing and monitoring. So, so that's that's a one way and one perspective of categorizing uh, the various steps. Uh, so I've just put this slide up. I'll talk about each of these points in detail. But if you look at the high level theme, really, right? Uh, the information blocking rule, the various regulations like CMS and, and ONC's regulations, uh, all are about interoperability at the end of the day, right? Uh, the US healthcare sector, as well as the global healthcare sector, realizes that interoperability is key to innovation, right? And, and that can be achieved through all of these regulations, uh, or it can be achieved through like various business requirements, right? Like, because if you expose different APIs, you can involve a, a stakeholder ecosystem. And if you have the ability to connect to different backend systems, you have better care, and then you can provide better value-based care. So there are different incentives of why this is useful. But if you look at that theme, it's really interoperability, which leads to innovation, but then there's a trade-off, right? How much do you expose and how do you secure that? Right? And that's where privacy and security comes in and, and is a very important aspect of all of this. Uh, so the way we've broken this is, as I mentioned, designing first. So you, you look at your platform, you look at your technology, uh, you design your API interfaces or you design your interfaces as APIs. We'll not go into the benefits of API management here. That's, that's pretty well known. But APIs really are a way of providing a standard, documented, discoverable interface to your internal stakeholders or your external uh, stakeholders. Right? Uh, then the second part is like once you've defined your APIs, once you've defined your interfaces, you need to be able to connect to the right source systems. right? Uh, and there's a lot of aspects you need to look at there. You need to look at whether the data is available, whether the data is of a higher quality, whether it is a timely set of data, whether it's accurate, whether it's secure, uh, and, and then where do you pull this data from? Right. So there's multiple aspects that you need to think about there. Sometimes it's directly, it's straightforward, right? Uh, Non-trivial, you just connect to the backend system. It's in a specific format. Sometimes it's very complex and you need to pull data from multiple sources and mash data up. So we'll look into that. Uh, the third part is basically securing access, right? As I mentioned, innovation and uh, interoperability and security is a trade-off really for innovation. So you need to expose these data as APIs. That's what the regulation says as well. But then at the same time, you need to put a lot of focus around security. And, and that includes the whole authentication authorization, uh, the integrity, the validity, as well as uh, platform level things like throttling, rate limiting, so on and so forth as well. And then of course, once you've set everything up, you need to ensure that they are operating in the right way. And that's where monitoring or observability comes into play. Uh, you need to track your key performance indicators. You need to have analytics, which, which, uh, which might be business analytics, uh, application level analytics, uh, system analytics, so on and so forth. Right? So there's multiple aspects here. So we'll go into these steps. Uh, along the way, I'll show some screenshots. And towards the end, uh, I'll, I'll show where these are available in the sandbox uh, that we have made available to you as well. All righty. Okay, so the first step is design. Uh, and, and I'll just put these as bullet points, right? So if you are designing your APIs, the first step is to define uh, the right interfaces uh, or select the right uh, fire APIs, right? Uh, in the past, there were different healthcare standards. Uh, HL7 is of course an international organization an international body that have defined different standards. Uh, FIRE is really HL7 uh, version 401, uh, if I remember that right. Um, and, and, and that's, of course, a fancy name of one of the HL7 versions. But the, the nice thing about FIRE is that's the basis for most of the US uh, regulations, the ONC and CMS regulations as well. So for organizations like payers and providers, uh, and, and most of you are from these organizations as well, uh, or vendors, uh, who want to develop and create APIs, the first step is to go to uh, one of the specifications which is hosted on HL7. Uh, the screenshot here is uh, the US co patient resource, right? And, and go in and figure out exactly what the language is and then come back and create your API. 
So depending on your industry, you would, or, or depending on your use case, you would select from, let's say the US Co specification, uh, HL7 International, uh, the Da Vinci specification, uh, Karin, Blue Button framework, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's that's one option. Uh, of course, if if you are using a technology platform that supports pre-built APIs, then you can just pick your APIs because again, uh, these APIs are already defined or the resources are defined. Uh, so a screenshot here is from the W2 plus ping sandbox, uh, which you have access to. Uh, so what is shown here is the list of uh, APIs under specific, uh, uh, under specification, right? Like for example, uh, the DaVinci specification. So you see like, for example, the appointment API or the audit event API or explanation of benefit or patient API, which I'll show in a bit. Right? So in that case, you just go in and pick the API uh, from a technical sense. That means you have the open API or Swagger specifications already defined. Uh, so you can pick the right API and that corresponds to uh, what HL7 has defined as well. So that saves you time, uh, whereas you don't have to like go and look at the specification and re-implement the API. The API is already available pre-built for you. So if you click on one of these, you can really go into the details there. Like if I click on explanation of benefits, which is part of the payer or, or the insurance industry, uh, you can see the various resources listed under explanation of benefits. And if you go to uh, the HL7 specification, carrying specification and look at explanation of benefits, you will have the same uh, level of detail and the same information there. The only difference is you need to convert that to an API uh, whereas in some platforms, you have the APIs already available. All right, so that's our third step. And once we've done that, we go to the fourth step, which is applying quality of service. Now, one of the things uh, that is missing in, in most of the guidelines out there, most of the CMS, ONC guidelines, is how to apply API management principles to designing uh, APIs. Right? Uh, so. There, there is a lot of discussion around what a fire server is. And what a fire server is, is really a place to host these fire resources. And that's a critical part of uh, these regulations, if, especially if you're dealing with fire, uh, fast healthcare, interoperability resource APIs. But API management is a critical part of that because these APIs are going to be exposed internally and externally they are going to be consumed by third-party developers. Uh, they need to have some level of workflows associated with it. They need to have uh, standard OpenID Connect Auth2 security protocols, which is also the basis of uh, the Smart on Fire specification that uh, the, the CMS regulation talks about. They also need to support things like rate limiting, throttling, uh, and then advanced capabilities such as monetization. All of those are API management, right? So, so this screen shows how you would apply various quality of service metrics. And most of the API management vendors can provide that. This is a screenshot from WSO2 uh, and plus Pink's sandbox, right? Again, you have access to this, but these are general steps which you can uh, you, you, uh, handle using like various vendor technology. So if you zoom into that, uh, this is a bit of a crowded slide, but you can see on the left-hand side menu, you, there is sections for endpoints, subscriptions, lifecycle, so on and so forth. And here you can handle like your transport level security, application level security, uh, handle your endpoints, et cetera. Right. <clears throat> then the last step in that is basically publishing this API. And when you say publishing an API, that really ends up in a fire server. So if you're talking about a fire uh, specific API, uh, as per the CMS regulation, the fire server is where that, that is hosted and the fire server needs to have certain capabilities, uh, which we'll talk about next. But the fire server usually needs to be part of an API gateway, a dedicated API gateway that is out there that can handle all these runtime aspects of API management. So in, in this architecture as well, as you can see here, the fire server is shown as part of the API gateway. The advantage of that is if you're talking uh, technicalities, uh, if you want, you can deploy the API gateway centrally, you can distribute it, you can have a hybrid deployment, you can have a, 
a, a micro deployment or Kubernetes based uh, deployment, so on and so forth. And the fire server will follow the same pattern, right? So whatever API gateway architecture you follow, the fire server is embedded in that. So you can follow the same pattern. So it's critical that you look at the fire server as an API gateway as well. And you don't look at the fire server as a totally independent component because the fire server is critical and, and there'll be people accessing APIs on the fire server. So it needs to be able to handle all the capabilities of an API gateway. All right, so those are five steps for designing as fire APIs, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, fire server, this, this screen shows one of the capabilities of a fire server, which is a capability statement. Right? So if an application comes and calls the fire server, the application should be able to say, hey, fire server, what do you support? And then the fire server returns a capability statement back saying, these are the capabilities I support, right? That's usually not a API gateway functionality, but that's a fire server functionality. So which is why you need the intersection of an API gateway as well as a fire server for healthcare APIs. And that's a critical aspect. All right, so five, six steps to design APIs. Then the next part is to expose these APIs externally. And, and the people who would be consuming these APIs are your internal development teams for your internal applications, like your portals and your mobile apps, uh, external third-party developers, right, uh, who are building smart on fire apps. So if you if you think back to Bernard's initial overview, this regulation, the one of the objectives of this regulation is to expose patients' information to approved third-party applications uh, belonging to the patients, or, or which is accessed by patients, right. So I, as a patient, should be able to go to my Apple Health app, for example, and be able to pull information from multiple hospitals and multiple insurance companies. Uh, there, there shouldn't be a need for me to go into those different locations independently, as is what is happening today. Of course, along the way, I need to provide consent. I need to prove that it is me who is accessing this data. Uh, and the provider needs to figure out whether this data belongs to me. Right? All of that happens in the back end. But APIs are one of the key aspects of enabling this. Right? So for these third-party developers to build smart on fire applications, you need to have a, a marketplace, an API marketplace, which provides access to the APIs, which provides documentation, SDKs, examples, uh, samples, all of that. Uh, and then where you can also control who can access the APIs, uh, how they can subscribe, pass them through a workflow, monetize wherever required, so on and so forth, right? So this is a view of the API marketplace, and this is also available in the sandbox. All right, so that's the design part. Of course, design includes many more elements, but we're keeping it brief and keeping it very high level, uh, but you can go and play around with the sandbox, uh, which is the full set of capabilities, right? It's a production ready sandbox, but of course, uh, the backend endpoints are uh, like a pre-production endpoints. Right, so you've designed your APIs. Now it's time to connect to the actual data sources. Uh, people do this in different ways. You can either start with your backend data sources and create APIs, or you can define your APIs and uh, connect to your backend data sources. So it is interchangeable. But usually in healthcare, uh, there are some well-known data sources or backend systems, right? The most common ones are electronic medical record, electronic health record systems like your Cerner's, Epics, uh, Allscripts, Athena, so on and so forth. Right? Uh, if you are in different industries, like if you're in the payer industry, you, you have claim management systems, so on and so forth as well. So there are different systems. And then you have generic systems like finance, uh, ERPs, uh, Salesforce, uh, et cetera, as well. Uh, there is a big uptake in health uh, data coming through wearable devices like Fitbits and Apple Watches. Uh, most of them also talk via Fire. Uh, so there's a lot of integration possibilities there. Uh, surprisingly, there's a lot of data sitting in databases as unstructured raw data. Uh, but with some of the customers that we've spoken to, uh, we've realized that that is one of the major use cases, right? In which case, it's not a direct connectivity. You need to be able to connect to the database and be able to convert 
between various data formats. Right? There's a lot of data sitting in cloud services as SaaS applications, so you need to be able to connect to them as well. Right? So bottom line, there are multiple types of backend systems you would have to connect to. Now, in some cases, you have, let's say, your patient API or explanation of benefit API. In some cases, you have the ability of directly connecting to your backend system, right? Uh, and and in, let's say your backend system is running Cerna or Epic or, or some EMR, uh, that system then exposes a standard compliant format. Uh, so so basically you are you're basically connecting to that uh, system, right? Uh, but in some cases that is not the case. Uh, that, let's say in in certain situations your backend system is not exposing a standard compliant format like Fire or HL7 V2. Uh, or in certain situations, you're, you have multiple backend systems and you need to combine data from those multiple systems. Or in certain situations, you are talking to a database, right? Uh, or in certain situations, uh, you need to transform or massage the data before you actually pass it on. So there are different requirements where you would not be able to directly connect to backend systems, right? And in those cases, you need to be able to drop down and handle complex integration, right? So we have two modes in the platform. One is a direct connectivity. So if you have a backend system, let's say you have Epic running in uh, HCA, or you have Cerna running in Mount Sinai, in which case you can say, I have Cerna running in Mount Sinai. This is my endpoint and it'll connect to the system and it'll ask you to authenticate yourself uh, when the actual API call is made. Uh, but if you want to go into an advanced mode, you can go into an advanced mode as well. So I'll talk about the advanced mode now. In an advanced mode, you also have a design option, right? So you, you really would decide whether you want to access your backend systems in real time, right? So that means uh, application is calling an API, API is calling uh, backend system like Epic, it fetches the information back real time and responds real time. Right? That's 60-70% uh, of the usage might be that. But there are situations where you would go for a non-real time, a synchronous or batch operation, which is what is shown on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we've, we've named it Fire Repository Based Fire Server. Right? In this case, you have your backend systems. Maybe there they are systems sitting in different facilities or different hospitals. You have periodic tasks that pull information from these backend systems and then push it into a into what is called a fire repository, right? Uh, and and then when the API call is made, the API call is made against the fire repository. So that's your second type. So in this case as well, you need the platform. Uh, to support those two use cases, whether regardless of whether it's uh, a real-time call or whether it's a, a synchronous API call. Uh, and if you have backend systems that do need some mapping, so let's say there is data in a database or you have multiple uh, backend systems and you need to combine the data together to provide one unified response, then you can use uh, of course, what the HL7 Fire has defined as well. Right? So this is just a diagram that shows the various HL7 resources. Uh, so one of the resources here is a Fire bundle, really, which means that you can combine multiple multiple resources, like multiple patient records, into a single Fire bundle and expose that as a, a combined, mashed up response. Right, and so th there are standards which basically support that right uh, so this shows again the different specifications like da vinci carrying blue button and then the different uh, items that within that but again if there are really complex uh, really uh, challenging integrations like for example your data sitting in a database uh, or data that needs to be transformed into uh, like a specific format from a different format like for example dicom to fire or x12 to some other format then you need the ability of having a, a low code integration platform which allows you to drag and drop or write code to handle these integrations right? 
So again, this is a screenshot of the low code integration platform, which is part of this solution, which allows you to do that. But again, keep in mind, if it's a straightforward connectivity to the backend, you don't need to drop down into this advanced mode. But if it's a complex integration, you have the option of dropping down into this advanced mode. Right? So, and, and again, if it's, if it's databases, you would have to do like very specific data mapping as well. So this is what is shown uh, in this through the visual data mapper. So bottom line in connectivity is that you have to connect your backend systems. Uh, in some cases, these are straightforward connections, especially if the backend system is already exposing data as fire and you have direct access to that system. In some cases, it's not straightforward, in which case you do need the ability of handling these challenging integration requirements. One of the uh, mistakes made often with uh, different platforms is that you just focus on one over the other. You focus on the simple case or you focus on the complex case, but you need the ability of handling both. All right, uh, with that, we are gonna cover secure and connect and, and I will hand over back to Bernard. So Bernard can go into that. And then of course, I'll take back the rain to end the session. Bernard, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mifan. That was, that was great. So <clears throat> let, let me take a, a few minutes to cover the security aspect. Uh, so you connect the data. Now keep in mind, the data that you're connecting to is some really valuable protected health information and any leaks at this point is going to be costly. Uh, so how do you go about protecting it? There are a couple of resources I wanted to point you to. One is the OWAPS API security top 10 uh, risk and the smart on fire uh, guidance uh, to properly uh, secure access. Uh, I'm going to go at a good pace so that we have time uh, for me fun at the end, uh, showing you the, the sandbox. But uh, OWASP and proper security in general, right, will guide you to a proper authentication, a proper authorization, um, understanding the behavior uh, of what's, uh, what's uh, happening on, on an API, and obviously the visibility monitoring side. And we'll talk more about each of those next. So authentication, uh, smart on fire is all about open ID connect and OS 2.0. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to really sort through this and implement uh, that uh, either directly or through the help of a platform uh, like uh, the one that Mifan was just talking about. Uh, so authentication. And then so it's about really making sure that uh, John Smith really is John Smith. Um, and he's a right John Smith, right? Um, and so once you have authenticated the person, now what rights does that person have to the data? And that's really the whole aspect of authorization, right? So there are, there are uh, uh, methods uh, to, uh, in some cases, um, you know, make it really easy. We have role-based access control with Zakamol and so forth. But in general, the scope of those tokens have to map into the proper uh, uh, authorization that you want to grant to that person trying to access the data or the application trying to access the health protected information. Okay, let's move on. Uh, security wise, um, you cannot deploy API without red limiting. Um, it's obviously first and foremost about making sure the API is not overflowed and this usage become very limited. Uh, but it's also protecting against DOS and DDoS attacks so that bad actors do not take away the, the actual service provided by the API um, uh, from the users, right? So proper rate limiting is important. Uh, you also need to have systems that can inspect payloads and understand if some of the payloads could be malicious. Um, I could mention XML time bombs and so forth, uh, but you also need basic web functions as well, right? So that your cross site scripting attacks, SQL injection attacks, so forth, uh, are detected in time. Remember one thing, and it's gonna be an important point for you. Uh, those type of, um, of uh, defense are rule-based, right? It means that the actual attack pattern is well understood it was actually pro programmed into a signature 
that has been provided to the wife. So the wife is looking for something that very precisely match what I know about the attack, right? So that's a typical SQL injection detection. It's important because modern day hacking on API does not follow those, uh, those, uh, those old patterns. There are a lot of freestylers out there and I will talk about that in a, in a few moments. So consent is a big part of the Cures Act, right? Um, no one should be able to access someone's uh, health information without the proper consent from that patient. But it also means that even so the act today uh, is an all or nothing in terms of consent. Uh, if you want to future prove this, you're going to have to inf put in place a fine grain enforcement, meaning, hey, don't give all of my record, all of my EHI, right, my electronic health information, all at once. I just want to provide to this hospital my name, my age, and maybe my phone number, right? That's all I want to give them. Don't give them anything else. I don't want my lab results. I don't want this, right? So, so fine grain in, in enforcement is going to be critical and really important in, in order to uh, get a full service uh, capability out there. Now, let me talk to you about modern day hacking on API, right? Because we're talking about HIPAA protected data. And this is the way hackers go about it, right? I sign up with a hospital. I sign up with a health insurance. I have an account, I have credentials, I'm connecting, I'm a real user, right? I have a token uh, and on the system, I'm real. I'm not a hacker, I'm a user, but I'm really a hacker. So what do I do? I'm gonna get out of that UI. I'm gonna bypass the UI. I'm gonna straight to the API. I'm gonna play on the API until I understand exactly how it works. And then I'm gonna look for vulnerability that let me take over an account and more. And that's how all of the API attacks practically almost all have happened over the last couple of years. And so you recognize now that rule-based defenses are not very effective against this type of attacks. And I can guarantee you that hackers will go after those fire APIs. It's a gold mine for them. Plus remember they are documented and the documentation is publicly made available by law. So it's an easy grab for all of those. So how do you go about recognizing when things don't go well, right? So you need platforms that can really capture a lot of traffic information, metadata, all those API transactions, so that you can recognize with AI what's abnormal. Remember rule-based stuff doesn't work there anymore. You have to recognize any abnormal activity on API and the resources behind them. So you need to lay a layer a, an AI capability on top of your gateway to really understand anything that's abnormal. So with AI, you literally model how the API is accessed and used. And then you use this to compare it constantly in real time to all of the activity for each patient. And the moment you detect something is not right, you can do something about it. The platform could block the access and force the user to reconnect now with another factor of authentication, for example, a FIDO key pin or a biometric so that the person is really who they say they are. So, but AI analytics on, on top of, layer on top of this API traffic is not just all about hacking. It's also about catching mishaps in production, right? A, a deployment that was not properly done and certainly, you have a massive issue that affecting the quality of service, you, which you will not see unless you have this capability of understanding traffic and abnormality on it. Uh, one of the big cases, partners and third party apps, right? Are they actually uh, interacting with the API in a way you intended to, or are they abusing the API? So this AI layer allows you to recognize any API misuse, abuse, um, mishap, is there a bug in the API it's in production? You know, 99% of the time is returning the data correctly by inspecting the token, but sometimes it gets into this one state, the vulnerable state, where it might return data without a proper token, for example. So you want to catch those bugs. So uh, a, a layer of AI on top of a, of a 
of, of, of a gateway platform, an API management platform, will give you this ability to cache those issues in production. And, and here are some examples of, of real life attacks, right? What do you do when a hacker is using an enormous amount of tokens with an enormous amount of devices? And by the way, it's not that he bought a hundred desktop to launch this attack. He's using virtual machines in a few servers. And then he launched these attacks on an API. You would probably not see it because you're always looking on a per token basis. So you need a system that can really line up, stitch together how each of those tokens are being used by that person in order to recognize an attack. And similarly, let's say I have an application with a UI and there's a certain flow right, with that application that really makes such that certain API cannot be used in certain sequences because of the UI. And so how about recognizing when there's an API missequence? Clearly the hacker is operating outside of the app and working directly on the API. So AI, two quick examples, right? Where AI allows you to recognize hacking techniques um, very quickly uh, without depending on any rules, policies, nothing needs to be written or updated. Okay, monitoring, big part. Monitoring is on two sides, right? You have a bunch of clusters of, of, of API platforms. Um, they are maybe on different data center, different clouds. And you need to be able to centralize the monitoring of all of that. And you need to be able to centralize the threat monitoring of all of those. And so having a platform, in this case, uh, um, we're showing a platform that Ping has, uh, Ping Intelligence for APIs, which really allows you to track everything that we just talked about on a per user identity basis, right? So a user is accessing uh, the, the WSO2 gateway platform in cloud one and in data center one, different API, different backend system, uh, where we can track all of those activities and line them all up to the user. And so user is accessing these three APIs or using these one or two or four or five tokens and it's what it's been doing. And then here, anything that was abnormal in that. So it's quite critical that you have an effective monitoring globally and then at the platform itself, right? At the platform itself, this is where you really want to understand uh, the, the actual usage performance and, and uh, analytics uh, on that platform for each API per token per user. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it back on to Mifan to really jump into this great sandbox that we built for you. And I need to stop my sharing, Mifan, go for it. All right, thank you, Bernard. So you have to bear with me again. All right, uh, so what, what we'll do is uh, I'm gonna go into the WSO2 plus ping sandbox uh, and then go through that and show you what the capabilities are. Uh, before that, just let me show you one more slide. Uh, so, so this is just to summarize what we were talking about, right? So the, the various concepts of the ONC, CMS, and the uh, 21st Century Cures Act and the information blocking rule are, are pretty uh, standard, right? And, and, that's, and uh, Bernard covered that really well. Following that, we went into the four steps that we would advise someone would, should take uh, in basically implementing and addressing those standards. So that's designing your interfaces, designing your APIs, connecting to your backend systems, securing those connectivities and APIs, and then observing and monitoring that. Right? Uh, a blueprint architecture we, we basically came up with to address all of this looks like this. And so it's a, it's a bit of a crowded architecture, but, and I'm not gonna go through everything, but you can see the various concepts we spoke about. Uh, you have the various stakeholders, the, the user groups. Uh, in the API and transformation layer, you have the API design concepts, uh, like the uh, API management, API designer, the API gateways and all which are the runtime parts, the marketplace, which is basically the place where APIs are published. Uh, Bernard spoke about consent management and consent enforcement. Uh, you have the other security concepts like the API access control uh, and the API intelligence, and you have observability capabilities such as API analytics, identity analytics, so on and so forth. Uh, Pre-built Fire APIs, the Fire server are all important parts of the Fire uh, journey. 
And then of course you need to connect to backend systems. And for that you have various accelerators, connectors, uh, so on and so forth. So that's the fire data mapping connectors, fire accelerators, EMR connectors, Lucerna's, Epics, et cetera. Uh, at the data layer, you need various ways of connecting the backend system. If it's an asynchronous uh, periodic model, then you need an asynchronous fire repository. Uh, you, you would need user repositories if you need to handle your users, which, which can include patients, physicians, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course the consent repository, which stores the actual content, which can be modified as and when uh, needed. Uh, and, and then of course you have the systems layer in the backend. So the sandbox uh, we will we'll show incorporates most of these. Uh, and then very specifically, since this is a joint webinar by WSO2 and PING, the joint solution addresses all of these components in the blueprint architecture, right? Uh, so most of these components are provided either by WSO2 or either by PING or uh, by both, right? So it's an it's a integrated solution that we basically have built. And, and when I share these slides as well, you can go into details and see what these look like. So this, the sandbox and the demo and the presentation and everything addresses various components. Some of these are of course visible components. Some of these are components that work in the backend. Uh, so let me minimize that and jump across to uh, the sandbox. So when you, so there's a link in the presentation, which we'll share. When you click on that link, you'll be taken to uh, the sign up page where you can sign up with your details. And once you sign up, you'll get a, a personalized uh, credentials, uh, which, which basically allows you to uh, sign into the system. Uh, so when I sign into the system, you have a URL there, which points to the live sandbox that is running. And this is the first view you would get, which is the API publisher view or the designer view, because of course, the assumption is that you need to design the APIs first and start from there. As part of this view, you have a list of existing APIs, a catalog of APIs, and you can pick and choose which APIs you want to implement. Uh, to make it easy, we have implemented five APIs already. So that is already available, connected to actual working backends. Right? So if I click on one of these APIs, like explanation of benefits, that takes me into uh, the actual details of the APIs. If you look at the left-hand side of the screen, this is what I was showing you previously as well. Let me just zoom in to that. Uh, you can see the various quality of services that can be attached to an API, right? So you have the design time and runtime configurations. Uh, you can configure your endpoint. So if it's a direct backend, you can configure your direct backend endpoint. Uh, you, you can, basically uh, determine whether this is a secured API or an open API and, and, determine, uh, and define what kind of security is used for backend connectivity and whether it's open ID connect and whether it's like a specific grant type uh, when you are exposing the API, uh, you can define your access control and scopes, so on and so forth, right? So that, that all happens with the API design view where you attach quality of services, right? Uh, and, and then of course, these are associated with subscriptions as well, right? So application developers subscribe to APIs. So you should be able to go in and see who is subscribed to your APIs and, and basically see what kind of usage they're using and block them, unblock them, do all of those aspects of standard API management. So that's all uh, part of the designing publishing view. And I'm not going to go into that because uh, you have access to it. So you can definitely use it, play around. And if you have any questions, just reach out to us. Um, and then the other part of it, of course, is the marketplace or the developer portal. Now this view shows you a list of the developer portal. Let me uh, make this a full screen that has a better view. If not, you're going to see everything in the back. All right, there you go. So here you can see the five APIs that were visible in the publisher is now available in the developer portal, right? Because we have published it. The user of the developer portal is application developers, either internal application developers or external application developers. Right? So you can see again, the APIs. Now, if I click on explanation of benefits again, right? I now would get a different set of information. Let me just sign in quickly with my credentials, right? Uh, click on that again. And here I get 
subscription information plus what's the API context? How do I access this API? Uh, and, and then what are the resources for this API? How do I access these, the different SDKs for this API, uh, so on and so forth, right? There is a forum, there's documentation SDKs associated with this API. So it's a different view because I am now an application developer and it's different from what I saw as a administrator or a designer of the API. So here I can try out APIs. I can basically generate keys, uh, embed this API into my application, etc. cetera. Um, if I go into subscriptions again, so the way I would access this API is by creating an application, right? So in, in the healthcare space, I would create a smart on fire application. So this platform also emulates that. So I can create an application, generate my keys for that application. Uh, so that shows the keys that are generated uh, and then embed those keys. But I can also try it out within the platform itself. There is a tryout section where I can basically try out the various resources uh, within this itself. So you can see this is a patient API and there's a patient resource, person resource, related person resource. So I can go in uh, and similar to how I would access an API, try out all of this. Right? So it's fully functional as a sandbox. Now, what we have also done is there is, because this is a partnership, we have an integration, right? So all of this information is now being sent to Ping Intelligence. Right? So the Ping Intelligence dashboard in the back end basically collects all of this information and, and there's a lot going on in the Ping Intelligence dashboard side. So Ping Intelligence shows the APIs that are consumed. Uh, it looks at the attacks that are possible. So if you look at the dashboard up here, there's various aspects showing IP blacklisting, cookie blacklisting, token blacklisting, user blacklisting, so on and so forth. Right? Uh, so, so we have, of course, flooded this system with data, which is why it's showing different blacklists, right? So the 32 token blacklists already, two uh, user blacklists already, so which is very valuable information. And then these can be tied up to notifications, uh, so on and so forth. If I go into a specific API, now this is an overall view, if I go into a specific API like patient API, uh, that gives me much more detailed information of how these attacks are taking place, right? What devices they're coming in from, uh, who the users are and how many requests they're doing, the different types of attacks as well, like header manipulation or user data uh, exfiltration. So quite valuable information, uh, especially from a securing side and an observability and monitoring side as well. Right? So all of that information is available uh, there in the WSO2 plus ping sandbox. You all have access to it. You just have to go sign up once we share the URL and you can play around with it and just reach out if you have any questions, but this is a fully functional sandbox, right? Now, what is missing in this sandbox is that advanced integration capability I spoke about. Uh, so if you do need to see that, just reach out again and, and we can enable some of them as well, but because that's not a web view. So because of that, that's not uh, available out of the box uh, in this sandbox. Uh, there is also a really good uh, user guide as well that we will share. Uh, that's the WC2 Plus Ping Open Healthcare Sandbox user guide, which goes into actual details of how you would set up and run this whole uh, sandbox. So that, that gives you a lot of good information there. All right. With that, let me go back to the presentation. I just have one more slide. Uh, there's a slide on how Ping and WSO2 can help. Uh, we do, as I mentioned, provide all of the capabilities in the blueprint out of the box, right? Uh, but I'll, I'll leave you to go through this slide. Uh, so we have the capabilities of handling a single user store, a pre-built fire API server and a marketplace and an API gateway, uh, ability to handle authentication. We have the various fire accelerators and connectors, uh, full patient consent management, including delegated consent management, uh, being able to observe and monitor the system, block abnormalities and detect anomalies, so on and so forth. Uh, so reach out to us at any time. Uh, in terms of resources and next steps, as Michael mentioned uh, initially, uh, you have access to the ping plus WSO2 sandbox. That's the URL right there. And we'll share that with you right after this uh, session. Uh, the user guide is also available, the guide that I showed you. So look at the user guide and go use the sandbox. 
We'll be sending you a copy of the 21st Century Cures Act Primer. Uh, and then this re recording of the webinar and the slides will be shared as well. And then we also have the contact information for WS2 and PING, so you feel free to reach out to us. With that, let me pause. We have just two minutes left. Uh, there are a few questions, so let me go through that. And, and Michael and Bernard, we can also go through the questions the minute I find them and address them. Uh, all right, there is one question. Sorry, I'm, you can see I'm uh, going around my screen because I have multiple screens. Let me stop sharing. That makes it easier. Okay, so the first question is, uh, does the WS2 healthcare platform fire templates include a pre-built structure of the allowed search parameters and includes, uh, and it, yeah, search parameters and includes, that is the capability of defined IGs like DaVinci, PlanNet, uh, Karin, BB, et cetera. Yes, so the answer is yes. Yeah, we, we have included allowed search parameters in our API definitions, right? And includes can be implemented using the fire bundle. Uh, support. So, so yes, the answer is yes to that. Uh, so the second question there, and Bernard, I'm, I'm taking this because I think uh, I can an answer some of these. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do the fire templates include the defined code systems and codes as defined by the specific IGs? Uh, some of them, yes. Uh, some of them are in the roadmap as well. Right? So, uh, and, and we can send all of that information to use very specifically as well. Um, there is another question, which is like how, how, in your experience with customers, how long does it take to basically become CMS compliant? Uh, so I'm assuming this is for specific industries like insurance companies. Uh, we've usually seen uh, around three months, two to three months, because the API is already defined, uh, and it also depends on your uh, backend systems. Uh, because we are out of time, there is also a poll here, uh, so feel free to fill that out, and based on that, we can also reach out to you. Uh, Michael, let me hand over to you for a quick uh, wrap up. All right, thank you guys. Uh, very informative um, uh, presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. And please, if there are any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, be sure to watch your inbox for the uh, items, uh, access to the sandbox, the primer, the quick reference guide, uh, and so on that uh, Mifon mentioned. Uh, those will be uh, sent out to you soon. Following that, you should look for the recording and slides of today's webinar. Thanks again for joining. We appreciate your attendance.